Hello. My name is Eric Bjorn. That's Eric. Okay. That's not me. There you go. That's Eric with an A and a K and Bjorn, which means bear in several Scandinavian languages. That's a very revolutionary name, you should agree. I was the 2016 Democratic Party and Green Party candidate for Congress here in South Carolina's 2nd Congressional District. More on that in a little bit. But back to my name. It's a name that's not too common down here in these southern parts. A lot of people have trouble pronouncing it, so we're going to do that together today. So we're going to say it three times, all right? Bjorn. 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 All right, now it's imprinted upon your nine minds forevermore. And if I was here today to sell you a, a product like a hair gel or a robotic vacuum cleaner, I'd have you hooked. Instead, I'm here to try to convince you to devote the rest of your life to building and maintaining civilization. To be revolutionary or not to be revolutionary. That's the theme of today's talk. About 10 days ago, I got a Facebook message that said, out of the blue, hey, would you like to give a TEDx talk? I said, TED talk? I said, technology, entertainment, design? Absolutely. What's the theme? To be revolutionary, they said. Oh, I passed out. When I woke up, I managed to barely type, dream come true. <laughs> they said, well, there's just one thing now. No partisan politics. You can't down talk other political figures. And you can't state opinions of any political controversy. I said, wait a second, I'm an actual politician. I ran for United States Congress in perhaps the most partisan election we've had in U.S. history. They said, yeah, but those are the rules. I said, all right, biggest challenge of my life. <laughs> I'm in. So, you say you want a revolution. Well, you know. Right here? What's that here? Ah, these aren't the Beatles you were expecting. <laughs> Sorry, folks. I, I wonder which one is Ringo. <laughs> to be revolutionary or not to be revolutionary, that is the question. Alas, poor voter I know, elected officials of such infinite chest, of most excellent fantasy, those who oppose bills of civilization that cross their legislative desks. Spotting revolution is easy, right? I mean, look, I got the hair, the beard, I got an anthropomorphic volleyball that likes mimosas. <laughs> I mean, clearly, I'm on the right side of history. Same with Gary, who resists, right? Except he doesn't have a volleyball. Let's consider today a quote that captures the quintessence of revolution, okay? The people's community must not be a mere phrase but a revolutionary achievement following from the radical carrying out of the basic life needs of the working class, a ruthless battle against corruption, a war against exploitation, freedom for the workers. Now that's pure revolution, right? I mean, look at that. Only a, pr a pure revolutionary would offer such a quote. Well, but who did, in fact, offer such a quote? Let's take a look. Uh-oh. Joseph Gerber. Prime Minister of Propaganda for Nazi Germany, 1933 to 1945? Stop! I know revolution, and that's not revolution, right? I mean, because revolution is uh, George Washington tossing off the British, right? Or uh, Mary Ann tossing off the French throne. Or how about Haiti tossing off the French? We all know about Anonymous, of course. How about Steve Jobs? And, of course, love. I mean, what could be more revolutionary? Well, it begs the question, doesn't it? What is revolution? By the way, this is Wilson. He was my constant campaign companion, the spirit, during the campaign. And if you didn't know this, um, by sheer coincidence, I practiced Joe Wilson. No relation to it. <laughs> <laughs> but he did make for a good icebreaker in the campaign. So he goes with me where I go. Anyway, revolution. What is revolution? That begs the question. We could spend all day talking about this definition, so I'll just give you a really quick one. Revolution is a fundamental change with sudden and lasting impact. Fundamental change with sudden and lasting impact. Now, it's a simple definition. We could spend our whole day talking about nothing else. But all to say that means that there are good and bad revolutions, aren't there? Good revolutions. How about the Copernican Revolution? Pretty good, right? How about the Phoenician alphabet? Thank you. How about Jimi Hendrix? Excuse me while I kiss this good revolution. But there are bad revolutions as well. I mean, the burning of the Reichstag was not a good revolution. How about fast food? Bad revolution. 
All the sake of sudden change for the sake of sudden change is not a good thing by itself. One person's revolution against corruption can be another person crime against humanity. All right, Gary, we're back to the drawing board. So you say you want a revolution. Well, maybe we should trust our esteemed event coordinators for asking me to provide a presentation today on revolution. Maybe I know something. Maybe something in my life happened. Maybe we could, in as nonpartisan a manner as possible, examine my 2016 congressional campaign. On November 6, 2012, I walked into my South Carolina 2nd Congressional District voting booth. And saw Joe Wilson, he, nonpartisan fact, who screamed in July at President Obama during the President's first state of the Union address, versus no Democrat. In a district of 700,000 individuals, not one person stepped forward to run for the Democratic Party platform. Thus, Joe Wilson, no value judgment on his long standing campaign or tenure in Congress. Waltzed off to Washington unopposed, with the exception of my friend Harold Gettys, who's in the audience today. Harold Gretton as an independent, but I've been offering catch to you. Well, that really stuck in my craw, Rob. Not that Harold Gretton, <laughs> but that no Democrat showed up to run against Joe Wilson. I mean, this is a major political party. Guess what? In 2014, a fake Democrat showed up to run against Joe Wilson. What do you mean, fake Democrat? That's exactly what I mean. By the time I ran, this individual ran against me, and the South Carolina Democratic Party was so tired of this person's shenanigans and not representing the party that they endorsed me before the primary, which was only the second time in history that it ever occurred. And I still can't tell what's worse, having nobody on the ballot or having an individual who does not correctly represent the party platform. All this smacks of revolution so far, right? Let's go back in time just a little bit more. My daughter, Kat, here. Ever since she was three, on every Martin Luther King Jr. day, we climbed the steps of the South Carolina State House. We had a little picnic with crackers and cheese and grandma's world class chocolate chip cookies. We talked about history and symbols and how we, the people, govern ourselves. And whether well, we're talking about the Confederate flag, the national health, or presidential policy, our conversations always end up with saying, So you see, sweetie, there's a better way. In fact, that became our campaign slogan there's a better way. Thus was a seed of action planted in the Father's heart, so that on March 24th, 2016, just hours before the filing deadline to run for office, I, being aware that no real Democrat would again run to represent my district of 700,000 people, showed up, signed my name to a piece of paper, wrote a check, and declared myself a Democratic Party candidate for Congress. Several months later, after we won the primary, by tens of votes, <laughs> 45 votes, Every vote matters. The South Carolina Green Party came up to me and said, hey, we'd like you to run for our party, too. I said, whoa, whoa, wait, I can do that? You mean my name will be on the ballot not once, but two times? And they said, yes. South Carolina remains one of nine states in the union where you, as a candidate, can represent more than one political party at a time. We call that fusion candidacy. And guess what? I wasn't the only federal fusion candidate in South Carolina in 2016. As it turns out, there were three other individuals who could not stomach the fact that their own political worldview was not going to be represented on a ballot. Thomas Dixon ran for U.S. Senate, and Demetri Cherney and Mal Hyman ran for the 1st and 7th Congressional Districts, respectively, the Coastal District. They weren't just Democratic Party and Green Party candidates. They took the Working Families Party as well. So their name wasn't on the ballot two times, but three times. I mean, what could be more revolutionary than four non-career politicians showing up, a, a pastor, an entrepreneur, a professor, and a public librarian, at the last second to run a seemingly impossible congressional campaign? It's incredible, right? Revolutionary. Except I tell them that I have the claim to be the most revolutionary because I got a beard. And a volleyball, and a guy named Gary. <laughs> Although, we have to give Demetri Cherney credit. He trekked across his entire district in an amphibious bike boat. And he went to remote islands of the coast that no congressional candidate had ever gone before. Still, I got the beard. <laughs> As to the beard. This beard actually makes a lot of people angry. Many people threaten not to vote for me because I have facial hair. It got to the point where I said, fine, I will create a committee to explore the matter. Members of the committee will be Socrates, Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, Moses, Jesus, and Gandalf. 
<laughs> Very few argue with me after that. Well, we did things in South Carolina that you're simply not supposed to do in the campaign trail. We decried rape culture at rock concerts. And I know I can't give you specific stated opinions today, so this may or may not be how I feel about the lack of federal funding for tens of thousands of backlog rape kits in the United States. We stood up boldly in South Carolina for workers' rights and labor unions, which in South Carolina is only outmatched and things you're not supposed to talk about on the campaign trail to LGBTQ rights. As it was, I was the first politician in South Carolina ever to attend SC Black Pride. We held the first transgender meet and greet. And the first person I asked to be a member of our advisory board was our state's leading transgender activist who's with us today, Dana. Welcome. We made women's rights the core of our campaign not in the margins. And we never hid the fact that South Carolina remains the fifth most dangerous state in the union for a woman to reside. We embraced interfaith communities. We went to Islamic centers, Hindu mandirs, Sikh temples, and other ethnic organizations, religious organizations. We think we're the first congressional campaign, maybe in the South, to have all of our literature translated into Spanish. Thank you to the Mesa families here today. We embraced the Hispanic Latino community and blazed the trail for future communities and candidates to do so in our five county district. Now, more parades than you can shake a camel at. Factory and more drum dairy. We even took a founding father's and founding mother's road trip to Montpelier, Monticello, and Washington, D.C. And my daughter wrote all of our social media posts for that whole week. I may have helped with spelling it. <laughs> Perhaps our major, most major accomplishment occurred at the Pelian Pita Party Parade. Prior to this, there were members of the DNC, of the DNC who told me to my face I was wasting my time running for office. South Carolina's second congressional district is the hardest district for Democrats to win, perhaps the whole nation. Why, you won't even get Joe Wilson to debate you one time. They were right. I didn't debate Joe Wilson one time. I debated him twice. <laughs> And I did all of this while working full time as a public librarian and I'm a single parent as well. I mean, what could be more revolutionary, right? So you say you want a revolution? Well, in our district, with a 23% Democratic base, we pulled in 36% of the vote in a year when Republicans stormed the ballots unlike anything before, like bulls on the back streets of Pamplona. And we did it with one tenth of the fundraising of a neighboring congressional campaign that got most of our state's fundraising low. And three visits from Vice President Biden. Guess what? Both campaigns have the same numbers. So I guess this rookie candidate did something right. But with all due respect to today's topic of being revolution, there wasn't one thing about our campaign that felt the least bit revolutionary. Now, I'm sure George Washington, Jusant Lukacher, and Steve Jobs were very conscious of their revolutionary personages, but I'm not. I'm not a revolutionary, and I'm not leading a revolutionary. Instead, our campaign from day one simply felt like it was always doing things the way they should be done. That is, maintaining, assisting, and enhancing life, as Albert Schweitzer once wrote. Not hindering and harming life. In fact, I might even dare to use a word like civilization to describe this white thing. In fact, if anything, our campaign for the United States Congress was an effort to breathe political life into a beautiful civilization framing, quote, by Martin Luther King Jr. in his 1964 Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech. I have the audacity to believe that peoples everywhere can have three meals a day for their body, and education and culture for their mind, and dignity, equality, and freedom for their spirits. I believe that what self-centered men have torn down men and women other Senate can build up. We don't need revolution to achieve Martin Luther King's belief, his audacious belief. But we do have to work together in unison to build and maintain civilization. We don't need pitchforks and torches so much as we need patience, critical thinking, and dogged perseverance. If the question is to be revolutionary or not to be revolutionary, then I think the answer is to build civilization. In the sense that civilization requires the individual and collective actions of all to build and maintain humane and just institutions. My 
We all have a part to play in building that. Every act of kindness, every gentle thought, every advancement of human knowledge is a step along the way. And it's going to take countless billions of such actions to lay that foundation. Is this revolution? Not the George Washington says, right? Because even then, when the Star Spangled Dust settled, women, slaves, average folk, Native Americans were just as well off as they were before. So if you came to this presentation today expecting cannonball burst at the end, I, I hate to disappoint. But really, what I would like to do is encourage each and every one of you to become agents of goodness, humaneness, peacemaking, civilization, in all that we do. Even in our politics. And I know that my friend Gary, who resists, would agree. Thank you very much.